Uh, good morning, everyone. You know, on camera, this looks like a pretty full crowd out here. That's, that's right, standing room only. But uh, we, we had a wonderful crowd Friday evening with the Christmas Eve service, and uh, we, we have a heart for the Lord Jesus in the people who are here today as well. So that's, that's a good thing. Good to, good to see everyone. Uh, let's stand together and uh, have a word of prayer, and then John and Sharon will, will lead us in our praise and worship. Father, you're so good to us. You've blessed us with your son, Jesus, with the opportunity to celebrate his birth, more importantly, to celebrate his life, his death, burial, and resurrection, which is for us and, and for the whole world. Help us, Father, to share the message so that more and more people will know of the unending joy that, that can be ours when we are in Jesus. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Join me as we sing Joy to Worship.
kind of like to lead us in as we worship together is great is your faithfulness. Praise God. Hello, church. As we prepare for communion, I'm going to read from Colossians chapter 1. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. The faith and love that springs from hope that is stored up in you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth the gospel that has come to you all over the world this gospel is being bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood god's grace in all its truth you have heard it from epaphras our dear fellow servant who is faithful and minister of Christ on our behalf and who has also uh, told us of your love for the, of his, in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we have heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power in accordance with his might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We have been rescued from this dark world. We have redemption through Christ and his sacrifice. We have forgiveness through his suffering, his pain, his 
death, burial, and resurrection. Just as he was raised, we will also be raised. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have these words in front of us, your words. We thank you that Jesus came to give us hope, to give us life, life everlasting with the Father in heaven. We pray that your blessing fall upon us, Father. Father, we thank you that Christ died and rose again. And the promise that we have will be the same. Resurrection in Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. Right now we ask the blessing upon us, Father. We ask the blessing upon this juice and this bread that represents Jesus' blood and Jesus' body. We thank you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time with um, for the service, we prepare our hearts for offering. Um, I've recently read something from Jack Cottrell, and I'm going to share that with you today. It's more or less a communion meditation, but we'll still work with offering, since Jesus did offer himself as a sacrifice in our place. Says, do you remember the best Christmas gift you got? What toy it was, what game it was? And Jack writes, the very words of God, it's more blessed to give than to receive in Acts 20, 35. God gave us a gift of his son Jesus. And we read that in John 3.16. In Matthew 20, 28, Jesus gave us the gift of, of his uh, self. He ransomed us. He gave himself his life for many as a ransom. As we just read, um, Jack mentioned that it was more or less a communion meditation. He said, the gifts that you have the emblems that you have in your hands that we just had, the bread and the juice. Think of yourself as when you're holding these emblems, gifts from Jesus, a present from God, the most wonderful gift he says, Jack says, that I've ever received. The giver of this gift is happier than you. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Jesus gave his life. So who's more happier? Jesus or you? The one receiving it? Or the one giving it? As we prepare our, our wallets and pocketbooks 
and prepare to give back a portion of what we have been given. Let's ask God for his blessings upon us in the gift. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus gave his life, his all in all for us. He sacrificed himself so that we may have eternal life. His gift to us is salvation. Father, let our gift to you be pleasing. Let our gift to you be worthy of you, Father. Father, we ask your blessing upon the gift and the giver at this time to bring glory to you and to help your kingdom grow. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a couple of announcements. First of all, no meetings this week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So take Tuesday evening, Wednesday evening. Now, next week, we'll get back to our regular schedule. Bible study will begin again on uh, Wednesday, 6 o'clock on the 5th of January. Uh, we will be uh, toward the end of 1 Timothy. And uh, so please join us. That, that'd be great. And again, we're, you can join us here in the uh, conference room for Bible study or by Zoom. Just let us know if you'd like a Zoom invitation. Uh, the next Defending the Faith class is Friday the 7th of January, and that's at 5 o'clock. Again, Zoom or in person. And uh, I've, I've been really fascinated with the different directions that uh, each leader has gone in talking about defending our faith and having things to share with others about, well, out of confidence because of our trust in God and our understanding of the Bible and, and gaining understanding in these things as well. Uh, the next ladies' study, I believe, is on the 8th, um, which is the second Saturday of January, and that's at 10 o'clock here in the building. Any other announcements, uh, Dave? Well, there's two things. We're moving our Monday morning meeting in January to Tuesday morning. Yes. Tuesday morning, and then we're Okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the office is closed this next week. Um, Sharon and I will be uh, headed this afternoon toward Indiana. We'll arrive in time for lunch with my father-in-law tomorrow. That's the plan, at least. Weather and traffic and, and everything uh, cooperating. So uh, please be sure and, and keep us in your prayers as we travel. But yeah, um, contact one of the elders. Um, I keep my cell phone with me, and I can gladly transfer the call to one of the elders. So uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, contact Dave. Um, and as Dave mentioned, um, we have regularly been meeting Monday mornings at 8 o'clock for prayer, first of the year. Uh, we'll be switching to Tuesday mornings at 8 o'clock. Usually we're, we're here in the conference room in the office area. Uh, every once in a while we go up the road to, to Coaster and uh, have fresher coffee that way, I guess you'd say. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Joe. Uh, also, there's a sign-up sheet for offering envelopes. If you'd like to have offering envelopes for 2022, ooh, that sounds like we shouldn't be there yet, but we are. Uh, and, and so please sign up and you'll receive the offering envelopes for, uh, for next year. Good, anything else? All right, uh, if you'd like to turn to your prayer list. And uh, we, ha we have some uh, prayer concerns and praises listed on our board here. And uh, for those of you watching online, you'll just have to take my word for it. Um, or you could go to the uh, uh, church Facebook page because today's prayer list is already posted there. And uh, some or most of these are, are already on there. Um, Dave asked for prayer for his uh, kidney stones and cysts. A uh, very uncomfortable situation. Um, I've asked for prayer for a man named Francis. Francis comes to a food pantry and um, is in failing health. His doctors say there's nothing more that they can do for him. We have a praise for our Christmas Eve service. We had about 45 people. And if everyone would just sit still, we'd count them, you know, but 
people are just not that way. But um, praise God, we had some, some guests with us, uh, first time uh, people to, to visit the church. We also had some folks back who hadn't been here for a while, mostly because of health, but other circumstances. And uh, so it was great to see Kim and Jean and, and uh, Marie uh, and, and others. Uh, so just praise God for, for that wonderful service. Uh, ladies did a great job. Helen, thank you. She went that way. Uh, thank, appreciate Helen organizing things with the, the ladies participating and Sharon and John with the, the music and Rhonda with the sound and the computer and, and um, you know, uh, others that served in, in different ways, the elders and you know what, it was a great service. It was a wonderful time in the Lord and it only took 45 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting, that's the one while that I, but well, anyways. <laughs> Um, we have a praise from my sister Rhonda. She got to ring the bell. Um, had her sixth and hopefully final chemo treatment uh, for her breast cancer. Please continue to pray for Rhonda and Craig. Uh, uh, pray for travelers for safety. Sharon and I, as I mentioned, are traveling. Others will be as well. And Sharon put a praise for her brother Steve. Uh, Steve is in some very challenging times health-wise right now and uh, is doing okay. So please uh, continue to pray for him. Um, what else? I think I mentioned most of the ones. Well, Jean asked for prayers for her friend Squeaky. Uh, found another mass in his lungs. Uh, also has some unspoken prayers, unspoken needs. Pray for our, our country, our church, and church family. Um, prayer, prayers for those traveling. Amy uh, Shorter asked for prayers for her father, Bob. Increasingly more difficult to breathe. So please keep, uh, keep Bob and, and that family in your prayers. Um, any other prayer needs or praises today? Al? I had a new great-grandson born yesterday. Well, about that. That's great. That's great. And, and how many great-grandkids does this make for you? Uh, well, I've got nine grandkids. Okay. I've got uh, seven great-grandkids. Okay. Oh, very good. Very good. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, praise God. Good. What else? Anything else to, to bring? All right. Well, let's pray. Father, it's, it's easy to assume that some people's prayers are more important than others. We know better than that. We know that each person, even if they're just praying and saying, Lord, help, or Lord, please help so-and-so, or help my family, or what, whatever. Father, thank you for those prayers. Thank you for those who pray with thankfulness. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to pray and to simply let your spirit interpret when we don't know what to pray or how to pray. Father, we are gathered here in your name, and so Jesus promised that where two or three are gathered in his name, there he would be in their midst, and so we welcome him. Father, thank you for being with each person who is a part of this fellowship especially with those who have lost loved ones, those who have gone through, through difficult times with their health, with their key relationships, with their finances and, and work. Father, thank you for bringing us through each of those, those circumstances. Father, I, I ask that you would help us, that we would be able to say the things and hear the things that you want for us and from us today. Father, I ask that you would speak through my heart to theirs. And Father, that you would work by your spirit to lead this church so that we would know the things that we need to do to reach out to more people and to, to build up your kingdom. Father, not our own. I thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers right now. Father, that you are with us wherever we are. Thank you, Father. 
I ask your blessing upon the rest of this service, and I thank you for the opportunity to commune around your table, to, to sing songs of praise to you. Father, to be lifted up by your word, by your spirit. Thank you, Father, for being with us this day and every day. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. Um, today we're going to talk about unending joy. Unending joy. And uh, uh, come on in. Now, this, this being toward the end of the year, I, I preached the letter E all year. And uh, so this is kind of transitioning from unending with an E, or we can say eternal joy. Next year, we're going to be in the letter J. And so if you want to start reading the Gospel of John, for example, then, then you can do that. Um, next week, we're going to talk about Jesus is coming again. And, uh, or the, the uh, end of the world, if you want to have another e sermon there. So today we're talking about joy. And when I read the, the Christmas story, I see a lot of fear. I see a lot of people that, that are really struggling, and, and a lot of this hits them unexpectedly. And so there's going to be some fear. And things happen that are of a miraculous nature that people are not ready for. I mean, suppose that, that uh, you are in your house in the morning drinking your first cup of coffee or tea or hot cocoa or whatever you like to drink in the morning, and, and you look at your dining room table and there's an angel sitting there. And the angel is kind of hunched over because they're too big to sit in your regular chairs. Are you going to be a bit alarmed by that? I think so. I think you're going to be shocked, surprised. Uh, I don't think you're going to say, oh, good, you're bringing me good news. It's like, oh, no, what have I done now? God's going to, going to really let me have it through this angel. And the angel says, don't be afraid. I come to bring you good news, uh, you know, great tidings of good news because of what has happened or, or something like that. But I see in the Bible lots of fear, lots of desperation, lots of, of people that, uh, well, they, they say that, that the years between the prophet Malachi and the birth of John the Baptist are 400 years of darkness where there were no prophets. And one of the writers during that time, um, the book of uh, Maccabee, or Maccabees, I guess there were four of those, that they said there was no prophet in Israel during that time. In other words, God had said everything that needed to be said until he's ready to send his son. And then John is going to come and then Jesus is going to be born and, and they're going to grow up and have messages to preach and that kind of thing. But there's, there are people that just are living life in such a humdrum sort of way. I look at the people even in the Christmas story. I see Zechariah, for example. Zechariah and Elizabeth were living a life of quiet desperation. I'm sure that their main prayer was, Lord, give us a child. Because back in that day, women who could not bear children were, were mocked, they were pitied, they were put down. And, uh, and so here's Elizabeth, well beyond childbearing years. But Zechariah is serving in the temple. And when he goes in to serve in the temple, there's an angel there. Now, this is an unusual occurrence. And the angel gives him a message. And eventually he says to Zechariah, Look, because you're doubting what I'm going to say, I'm going to give you a sign. And the sign is you're not going to speak until your son is born and you give him the right name, John. You, you can look it up in Luke chapter 1 and the story there of, of Zechariah and Elizabeth. But Zechariah is fearful, except when his son is born, he gives him the name John, then he can speak. And there's kind of a humorous point in here when, when uh, the baby is born and they're trying to name the baby after Zechariah and Zechariah says no. And so they get paper and pencils or whatever writing implements they had back then and they start writing to him. He's not deaf. He's not deaf. But you picture these people. What would you like? All right, that strikes me as funny. Apparently I'm the only one. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. But Zechariah and Elizabeth have this quiet desperation they're putting their trust in God, and yet 
God hasn't come through yet. It's past time. I look at, at another character in the Christmas story is King Herod. Desperation and fear, this man's fear turned to anger. He killed his own family members out of fear that they would try to supplant him as the king. And so he hears about this king being born in Bethlehem. And he says to these three wise guys, he says, hey, when you find this baby who is born king of the Jews, come back and tell me where you found him so I too can go and worship him. <laughs> now, now the Magi, it never mentions fear in them. But you wonder if as they're traveling across the desert on what could have been a year or longer journey, you know, uh, carrying lots of um, valuables with them across. And, and by the way, we, we don't know how many there were. We don't know what their names were. The Bible doesn't tell us any of that. Tradition gives us some, whatever. But they come into Jerusalem wondering, they had to be wondering if they're ever going to find this baby. I mean, maybe, maybe there are people who are going to try to cheat them out of their gifts that they brought. I mean, who knows? Who knows what their thoughts were? But God showed them. And part of it was through Herod and his scholars. Well, the baby was to be born in Bethlehem. They're familiar with Micah 5 too. And so they go and they worship. But now there's fear. But God says, don't go back to Jerusalem, go a different way. We're not going to help Herod find this child. Mary is kind of, I don't know that she was fearful, but I'm sure she was shocked by an angel appearing to her. And here she is, a young woman, and she knew the, the facts of life. She knew the birds and the bees because the angel says, Mary, you know, you're favored by God. And she's like, what? What, what do you mean? Does, does God even know who I am? Have, have you ever wondered that? You know, does God even know who I am and my circumstances and what I'm going through? And it's easy to wonder that, isn't it, sometimes? But Mary must have been having lots of instantaneous type of thoughts about, <laughs> why is this angel here and what does he mean? But when the angel says you're going to have a child, she says, oh, time out. I've never been with a man. I, I, I can't have a child. At what point did she wonder how Joseph would respond to this news about her having a child? She's been faithful to him, not been with any other man, obviously. And yet he would have to wonder how this child had come in, into being. Joseph himself has an angel appear to him in a dream. And, and he's going to take Mary in spite of maybe his own family and friends saying, hey, you know better than this. She says an angel appeared to her. You had a dream. You're, you're fooling yourself. Did it rise to the level of kind of a quiet desperation and fear? Probably. But Joseph did the right thing. He was a righteous man. And Mary was doing the right thing. She was obedient to God. She... She says, uh, I am the Lord's servant. May his will be fulfilled in me. Wow, that's amazing. Now, I hope that you're kind of listening to these stories and kind of plugging in. And I know our circumstances are not going to be identical to theirs. I, I've not yet been a king who was afraid of his own family, you know, that, that they were going to try to kick me off my throne. I've never been uh, serving in the temple and having an angel appear to me and, and saying, you know, go home and get your wife pregnant so that, oh, oh, you know, wait a minute. I've never been in Joseph's situation or Mary's. But there are lots of times that even in our world today, there is quiet desperation. And sometimes that's us. Sometimes we don't like the position that we're put in in life. We wish it was different. And so... The lesson here is that not everything in life is going to make us happy, but we need to have the joy that God gives. And you've heard me say frequently over the years that happiness comes from what happens, and there are lots of things that happen that we don't like. They don't make us happy. But joy comes from Jesus inside. And even when we're not happy with life and circumstances and whatever, that we can still have that joy 
that contentment, that confidence that comes from putting our trust in him. And when we don't see things right now being the way that we want them to be, when we put our trust in him, we're saying, God, you're going to work in these circumstances. You're going to teach me lessons. You're going to bring people into my life to help me or that I can help because of what I'm going through right now. You're going to use these to build your kingdom, not necessarily mine. And so God doesn't necessarily take things away from us, but he helps pull that burden. We've spoken recently about Matthew 11, Jesus saying, come to me all who are heavy burdened and you know, heavy laden and burdened and how he pulls the load with us. We've talked about that. Well, the shepherds also had fear when these angels appeared to them. And, you know, when I think about life today, I think about lots of people that, that have this fear and desperation that comes from so many different areas of life. For a lot of people, it's their health. And we mentioned at prayer time, you know, my sister going through breast cancer, Sharon's brother with Parkinson's. These are very recent developments in our families, in our family. Here in, in many people's lives, uh, COVID has, has created circumstances. Uh, talk about fear and desperation, right? It's changed the economy. A lot of people have lost their jobs or are not going to work that used to have financial situations. And, uh, you know, with our economy, with the talk about inflation and all these kinds of, there are just so many areas of life in, in people's relationships and, you know, even where they live and, and changing circumstances there and, and just so many things. That's where the joy comes in where trusting God makes a huge, huge difference. Sometimes people have fear and desperation because they are praying and seeking the Lord and God isn't answering yet. Or God doesn't necessarily answer the way that we want him to answer. You know, please bring healing for my loved one. Lots of times God lets nature take its course. I, I can't tell you why. I wish I could. I wish I was that smart. I'm not. You knew that, right? I, I wish I could know the mind of God that completely. Honestly, I'd be very cautious about it even if I thought I knew the mind of God that well because I want to be true to what he says in the scripture. And yes, we're led by his spirit, but there are lots of times that I hear people make statements that I'm like, time out. How do you know that? Yes, you have a confidence, but is your confidence in God or is it in yourself? And so we need to know the word better. We need to be open to God's continual leading. Pretty important stuff, isn't it? There are times that we say, God, why don't you change this? Or why don't you help me with that? And the answer is that, that many times help is on the way or maybe he's already provided that we just kind of missed it or we sloughed over it or whatever. But we, we just have to keep going back to the Lord. Keep seeking him. Keep knowing that, that he wants us to know his will and to do his will so that, that he is glorified in us. Well, we've talked about fear and desperation. Let's talk about joy in that Christmas story. I, I look at Zechariah and Elizabeth and there, there had to have been a strange situation where Elizabeth now is at guess an age, I don't know, in her 60s, in her 70s, well beyond childbearing years, as we said, and so she's pregnant, and now she kind of hides in the house, you know? And then when the angel appears to Mary, the angel says, oh, and by the way, you want some evidence about this? Your relative Elizabeth is expecting a child. Mary gets on her horse, whatever, and goes toward Jerusalem to Zechariah and Elizabeth. And when she arrives there, Elizabeth comes out to greet her. And the baby inside of Elizabeth leaps for joy. That's John. Meeting his cousin Jesus for the first time. Two pregnant women. And that sign for Mary and for Elizabeth and Zechariah was so important. And so you can sense the joy that is in them. As a matter of fact, right after this, Mary, 
and, and typically in some churches, this is known as the Magnificent. Mary gives a praise to God, talking about how magnificent God is. She says, my soul glorifies the Lord. This is Luke 1, 46 and following. Mary said, and my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. She says, my soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices. There's that word joy in the word rejoice. She has a confidence and a contentment that God's work and God's will is being done through her. Friends, we need to seek that daily. And many times we know. We know we're doing the right thing. Um, there have been a number of times that I've had people mock me for my Christianity and I say, wow, thank you, God. You're putting me in a position where people know that, that this makes a difference. I like that. Doesn't always feel good at the moment, but that's okay. I think about the shepherds and the joy that they had when they saw the angels, heard the angels sing. That had to have been magnificent. Now, when my wife sings, it's like an angel singing to me. So, for, for 12 hours today, we're going to be in the car together. Yeah. yeah. Now, I can say a lot more, but they'll just get me in trouble. Like how nice you look Friday night. Yeah, yeah. I, I, oh, okay. I should go on with my sermon. Gotcha. The shepherds. That's where we were. Yeah. They went into Bethlehem or whatever suburb <laughs> Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus were in at that point. And uh, they saw this child. Now, what I love about this, okay, the Magi, they didn't come till later. Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus were in a house at that point. I know the manger scene that you've got there on your table has the magi there with the shepherds and whatever. Picture it however you want. It'd be kind of weird if you left the manger scene up and, and you waited like a year until you put the magi up. But that'd be next Christmas. Well, anyways. The poorest the people who were most disregarded other than lepers and tax collectors <laughs> were the shepherds and the magi, the wealthy, the, uh, the people who had influence and every place in between. King Herod never got to see that baby, praise God. You know, but, but lots of others did. And so the joy that the shepherds had, and we can look at, at Luke 2, 8 through 20. We're not going to take the time to read that. Just now, it was read the other evening. If you were able to be here for the Christmas Eve service. But the shepherds have amazing joy. They also rejoice. And especially that little drummer boy, you know. Anyways, that's not in the Bible. Just kidding. There are a number of scriptures that talk about joy. Let's take a look at some of them. Let's go to Isaiah 12, 1 through 6. And uh, I, by the way, that's the entire 12th chapter of Isaiah, is the sixth verse, uh, six verses there. Isaiah 12, in that day, you will say, I will praise you, Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. I like that. You ever been so thirsty? I'm sure you have at some point. But I remember years ago, we used to have two-a-day football practices when I was in high school. And our team was bad, and there weren't very many players on it. And but I'd get home, and I was so thirsty. And there was a whole swimming pool in the backyard, but it had that chlorine stuff in it. Ugh. Going through the kitchen, get nice water. Oh my. It's like every cell in your body feels there's water coming to it. 
Isaiah compares it with salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. When we know that we have Jesus, that he cares about us, that he loved us in such a way that he would give his life on Calvary's cross. And to know that when we leave this world, we go from life to life. One of our professors in Bible college, one of his favorite things to say was that the, the once born man dies twice and the twice born man dies once. The once born man was born into this world but was not born again. He dies spiritually and dies for eternity. The twice born man is born into this world and born into God's kingdom. And not just men, of course, we as his people go from life to life. Let's go to Isaiah 9. This is a, a well-known passage at Christmas every year. Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. In the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations. Oh, the Gentiles. <laughs> By the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Oh, that 400 years, right? On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. Ah, farm community. You know, every every so many years they get kind of a kind of a, a bust when it comes to the harvest. So when the harvest is good, and and Hal and I were talking the other day about about harvesting. He's got a lot more experience with that than I do. But just knowing that you can go acre after acre, field after field, and bring in that harvest in, and it provides food, it provides income for these farm families and those farm communities. It's a relief when the harvest is brought in. The joy that, that could be had when we come to him, when we know that we belong to him, he belongs to us. A little bit later on, verse six, uh, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. He is the one who gives joy. He is the one who gives what we need. Let's go to John 15. Jesus says, starting in verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now think about what's happening here in John 15. Uh, by the way, let me read the next couple verses. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. He's getting close. It's been two chapters since he washed their feet, which happened the same time as the last supper. Last supper. As he talks to them, he is someplace between hours and minutes from being arrested, put on trial, taken to Calvary, put on the cross. And what's he talking about? He's talking about love. He's talking about joy. Because they needed to know that whatever happened to him, whether they anticipated or not, and he had told them so many times what was going to happen, but they didn't get it. It's hard for us if we don't have that context. And when it happened, they didn't understand it, but later they did. But now they can talk about love. And the love that he has with the Father and he has with them that he shares. And, and about the joy. Let me read that verse again. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Was Jesus happy about going to the cross? No. He said, Father, if this cup can pass from me, please take it away. But not my will, your will be done. 
The cross that many of us bear is heavy. And is it heavy compared with everyone else? Who knows? My cross is my cross and your cross is yours. And when we have the opportunity to honor the Lord by carrying the cross he's given us, that brings joy. A lot of people complain bitterly about the difficulties of life. And I understand that because it's not what we anticipate. It's not what we want. It's not how we want to live our lives. But God uses our lives to bring glory to himself and to build his kingdom. May we find joy in the ways that we serve him. Well, let's go ahead. Um, joy comes through many things. I look at Mary. Mary is our rock in this story. And I understand that some churches exalt Mary and, and you know, because she's the mother of our Lord and, and that kind of thing. Mary was a human being. She needed Jesus to die for her every bit as much as we do. And we did. Uh, she had a, a, a joyful and a painful burden that she carried through life. You can look back at, at uh, Luke chapter 2 later down in the chapter there when Simeon, I believe it is, yeah, uh, addresses them and he says, Mary, a, 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 an arrow will pierce your heart. That doesn't sound fun. That doesn't sound good. But as she watched Jesus grow up, she had to know how different he was. And his unique way was because of his mission and as he fulfilled God's plan. So Mary, she's just ready in short order to do what God wants her to do. And I, I read already her words about rejoicing and joy. Uh, how about the message? The angels are proclaiming that God cares, that God loves, that God is the solution to their problems. And maybe the shepherds didn't know they had problems. Maybe, maybe sin was not the foremost thing on their minds. But if you want eternal life, it's going to come through a, a perfect and holy God. And so we have to be perfect and holy to get into heaven. What? Well, wait, Matt. I, I, I'm not perfect. Are you? Well, no, I'm not. So how do we get into heaven if we're not perfect and holy? It's through the blood of Jesus. That cleanses us from all sin. When we stand before God, it's not going to be our righteousness. I will not say, God, I was good enough. You ought to just let me into heaven. I don't know that anyone will laugh. But they might as well if I say that. When I stand before him, it's going to be, Father, your son died for me and washed away my sins. Can I come in, please? That's, that's what God brings to all of us through Jesus. And so the message of salvation, the message of the birth of this child who would grow up to do all the things God wanted him to do. Well, joy comes through the Messiah. We've read just a few minutes ago, wonderful counselor, almighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, Jesus, the one who brings light in the darkness. We also know that joy comes from hope. Let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 1. And I've, I found that as I was writing out the scriptures for this, that these are passages I've used other times recently. And that's not a bad thing. I can find other passages, but sometimes we need to be reminded about something a few different times. But I think about how joy comes from hope. Hope is confidence, it is contentment, it is a realization that even though we don't see what God is doing every minute of the day and, and what he'll do in eternity, that we put our trust in him. Let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 1, 3 through 9. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, there's that word, Though now for a little while you have, may have had the genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. I read that badly. Ah, I kind of skipped a line there, didn't I? Verse 6, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. <laughs> kind of an important part there that I missed, wasn't it? We rejoice. Is life perfect? Is it ideal? Is it wonderful? It can be. It can be. I, I don't know anybody that I would trade my life with. I'm certainly not perfect, and my life isn't perfect in every way. I can certainly complain about things. I'd be a fool if I did, or I'm a fool when I do. <laughs> but when I have that joy, that comes from Jesus. He lifts me up. He shows me things about my life that, that I won't see if I'm letting myself be down in the dumps and complaining and whining and, and... No. We need to have that joy. We need to look to Jesus and to realize how important he is in our lives every minute of every day. Now, is it that simple? You know, there are a lot of things that, that vie for our attention, aren't there? And that's okay. We, you know, when, when you're sitting down to pay your bills, you know, at the end of the month or the beginning of the month or the middle of the month, whenever you pay bills, we don't always sit there and say, praise Jesus, praise Jesus. Sometimes it's like, oh, I still have money left in my account. I don't know where I'm going to spend that nickel. But praise God, you know. A lot of times it's lifting our eyes above the things of this world and letting Jesus bring that joy to us. Well, there's a lot more that, that can be said. But I trust that, that God will use his word and his spirit to help us have more joy if we let him, if we seek his help and his favor and recognize that, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, even at my age, I'm not expecting to have a baby, you know, I'm just not. But God has different plans for me than he had for Mary. And we have an opportunity to lift up his name and to share that joy with others around us. Let's strive to do that as often as we can. Let's go to God. Father, you are the, the great and awesome one. So many times when we let this world get to us, we take our eyes off of you. We're almost like Peter who stepped over the side of the boat and really showed a lot of courage, a lot of faith, but he took his eyes off Jesus. Father, help us to step over the side of the boat, but keep our eyes on you. And sometimes it's just a matter of letting go of our favorite things to complain about or to observe in our lives. But Father, we know that we need you. We need to draw closer to you every day. Thank you, Father, for blessing us, for helping us each day. May we honor you and your name. Fulfill your plan in our lives. Thank you, Father. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> yeah, Sharon added uh, another uh, prayer need. Uh, it was so good to see uh, Marie and Lisa here last night, or uh, Friday night, and uh, Nell was with them. And uh, Nell and Bob Morell, 
um, our, our family and neighbors to the Hewitts. And uh, Bob is in the hospital and um, has had some, some diagnoses. And, uh, you know, Nell has some connection problems. Um, I don't know how to characterize them with a, a medical diagnosis, but um, she, she needs Bob to help her and the family to help her. So please keep Bob and, and Nell in your prayers. Um, Bob is supposed to come home sometime soon from the hospital. Uh, there's just talk about, you know, how best to help them and um, whether they are able to function on their own or have extra help or whatever. So thank you, Sharon. Appreciate that. Uh, are there any other announcements? And is there anything else that needs to be said? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Sharon. Um, excuse me. On January 1st, we have a pickup. And if y'all are not going to be up here um, to prayers on Monday morning, yeah. we can have this pickup. Okay. So we'll meet back here at the church at 845. Okay. Okay. So 845 Monday morning, January 3rd. Uh, to help with uh, the food pantry pickup. So, well, good. Um, I'll, I'll try to be here. Um, st still be a little bleary-eyed from travel and whatever, but I mean, I'll be back here Sunday. So, um, yeah, good. Okay, anything else that needs to be said? Um, Sharon and I would like to thank you for gifts, uh, for the blessing that, that uh, each one of you has given us, uh, whether it's a material gift or just the gift of your love and, and uh, you know, your service to God. We just appreciate every one of you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have, have a great week this week. Thank you.